السلام علیکم آئی ایم ڈاکٹر آبا سجاد فرام اناٹمی ڈپارٹمنٹ سہارا میڈیکل کالج ناروال ٹو دے دا ٹاپک آف ڈسکشن از گلوٹیل مسل اینڈ گریٹر اینڈ لیسر شارٹک فارمنا سو ان ٹو ڈیز لیکچر وی آر گوئنگ ٹو انڈرسٹینڈ دا پریویسلی ڈسکس اٹیچمنٹ آف گلوٹیل مسلس آن ہپ بون اینڈ فیمر اینڈ وی آر گنا انڈرسٹینڈ دا اورینٹیشن آف دا فائبرس اینڈ The, they function according to the direction of fibers then we are going to learn how we can test the uh, potency of these muscles the action of these muscles in patients and abnormalities related to their paralysis then we can uh, discuss in the end the gateways from which uh, structures pass from the pelvic cavity to the gluteal region and they are the greater and lesser sciatic foramina The gluteal region is present on the posterior aspect of hip girdle and it is basically the junction between the posterior side of trunk and lower limbs. We can see that uh, looking at this picture, the bony parts are the outer aspect of the hip bone. Mainly you can see the ileum, the gluteal surfaces and we can see the ischium making the main part in the gluteal region. Uh, then we can observe some important ligaments where the posterior uh, or the midline bone sacrum is joining the ileum there is sacroiliac joint and you can see an important uh, ligament posterior sacroiliac ligament uh, supporting it posteriorly there are other ligaments also supporting uh, this joint anteriorly and superiorly which we'll discuss uh, later with the joint then we can see the hip bone form between the femur and uh, acetabulum and there are also ligaments covering these uh, this joint now you can observe the most important ligaments of the hip region uh, which are first of all the sacrotuberous ligament which is the larger one arising from the mo uh, posterior aspect of um, uh, sacrum here and is attached to the sacral tuberosity and then um, there is another ligament deep to it or you should say anterior to it uh, it is arising from the lateral aspect of uh, lower part of sacrum and is attached to the um, spine ischial spine and it is called sacrospinous ligament these two are very important ligaments as they are going to convert greater sciatic notch and lesser sciatic notch into foramina and major important structures uh, coming to the posterior aspect of uh, lower limb are passing through these foramina greater sciatic foramen is connecting uh, the pelvis to uh, the gluteal region while lesser sciatic foramen is connecting the perineum to the gluteal region looking at this diagram uh, we had previously done for the attachments you can observe that uh, muscles of the gluteal region mostly the superficial ones are arising from the gluteal surface and the deep ones uh, or the smaller ones are arising from around the ischium and they are inserted around the greater trochanter uh, from anterior aspect to lateral and then to posterior aspect Now looking at the fascia in the other diagram you can observe that there is a sleeve like fascia covering the thigh and packing those muscles uh, within the compartments and this fascia is known as fascia lata but you can uh, clearly observe that the la on the lateral aspect this fascia is thickened like a band like structure and uh, it is known as iliotibial tract as it is uh, starting from iliac tubercle and attached up to the tubercle of uh, tibia so basically it is called iliotibial tract it is important uh, to compress the uh, thigh muscles laterally and keep them in place during movements and it is supported by the muscles of gluteal region as they are attached on it the fascia continues over the gluteal region as the gluteal fascia you can observe the fascia over the gluteus maximus you can also observe the fact that all of the muscles of gluteal region are covered by a large muscle known as gluteus maximus except for the anterolateral part of uh, uh, 
gluteus medius now we discuss the muscles of gluteal region in detail there are four muscles of uh, gluteal region which are superficial and four muscles which are in the deep layer so totally we have eight muscles of gluteal region on the left side you can observe the uh, superficial muscles two of them can be observed here the gluteus maximus and tensor fascia lata and then and the rest of the two larger muscles are gluteus medius and minimus these four muscles form the superficial layer while you can see um, in the right side uh, diagram uh, the piriformis muscle above the sciatic nerve and below the sciatic nerve you can observe the three muscles uh, gamma and obturator internus and um, the last muscle is the quadratus femoris uh, they are more clear and uh, individually discussed in the other slides collectively talking the action of these muscles are um, a gluteus maximus from the superficial group is an extensor a strong extensor of um, a hip joint and a lateral rotator while gluteus medius and minimus they are mainly abductors and medial rotators as their their attachment is more towards the anterior aspect of greater trochanter then if we observe the um, deep muscles rather the fourth muscle the tensor fascia lata that's um, a muscle of gluteal region but it is going to uh, perform flexion of hip joint as you can see the tensor fascia lata is uh, more post anteriorly and it is close to sartorius all the deep muscles are mainly lateral rotators of hip joint and slightly they help in abduction of the hip joint so basically among the superficial group one maximus is the lateral rotator tensor fascia lata is the lateral rotator two and three uh, gluteus medius and four minimus they are medial rotator and abductors in the deep muscles all of them are lateral rotators and um, the piriformis muscle and along with the obturator internus causes abduction also the small muscles are also important for keeping the head of femur in the uh, socket of his rabulum and stabilizing the hip joint we'll discuss these actions independently Of the superficial layer, first two muscles that can be seen in this diagram are gluteus maximus and tensor fascia lata. So we'll discuss them in detail here. Gluteus maximus takes origin from the outer surface or gluteal surface of ilium, uh, posterior to the posterior gluteal line, as you can see in this diagram. And adjacent to that, it is arising here from the posterior aspect of uh, sacrum and coccyx. And as the sacrotuberous ligament is originating from this part, so the gluteus maximus fibers are also originating from that ligament. Now in the diagram, the cut fibers of gluteus maximus have been shown clearly. There are superficial fibers making three-fourths of the muscle. They are attached basically to the uh, iliotibial tract, which is basically the lateral thickened part of the um, uh, iliotibial uh, or of uh, fascia lata while one third of one fourth of the deep fibers are or the lower deep fibers are attached to the gluteal tuberosity present on the posterior aspect of femur in the diagram you can observe that the iliotibial tract is attached from iliac uh, crest up to the tibia the lateral or anterolateral tubercle of tibia, Gerdes tubercle. But you can also uh, see that uh, from the inner side of uh, iliotibial tract, a septum arises and is attached to the lateral lip of linea aspera. This is the lateral intermuscular septum, which along with the medial and posterior intermuscular septa divides the thigh muscles into compartments. 
So we can see that gluteus maximus is attached to the posterior surface of uh, femur on the gluteal tuberosity, one fourth fiber. Then we can see that uh, major fiber, majority of the fibers are attached to the iliotibial tract and through iliotibial tract, the gluteus maximus is also attached to the posterior uh, uh, surface of femur on the linea aspera and on the tibia, the anterolateral tubercle. The nerve supply and the uh, um, blood supply of the muscles of gluteal region will be discussed separately. When gluteus maximus contracts, it is a lateral rotator of thigh at hip joint. It is also an extensor of hip joint. Now, when we are uh, walking normally on a straight ground, the extension of hip joint is carried out by the hamstring. So gluteus maximus muscle is not used at a greater extent. Only a few fibers are contracting. Although it is the strongest extensor in the gluteal region and uh, strongest extensor of the hip, but it is used more as a power horse when we are climbing the stairs and straightening up from a sitting position. In this case, the limb is fixed as we are sitting or when we put our foot on the stair, the limb is fixed. So when the gluteus maximus is extending the hip, the trunk is moving, the trunk is being extended. And in this way, the weight is straightened up. So there is more force required in this situation during the extension at hip joint. So it is an extensor of hip joint when we have to act against gravity. And as it is inserted on the lateral side, so it is also a lateral rotator. An important thing to observe is also that when we sit down, the lower border of luteus maximus is shifted slightly upwards as the thigh is flexed. So some part of the Ischial tuberosity, which doesn't have any muscle attachment, is exposed. And this is the part which is on the um, ground or on the chair when we are sitting. And in between the skin and this part is a, is a bursa. So basically when we sit down, gluteus, we are not sitting on the gluteus maximus. We are sitting on the ischial tuberosity. Now, because the um, iliotibial tract is attached through lateral intervascular septum to femur, and also to tibia on the Gerdes tubercle. The gluteus maximus and even the tensile facial lateral muscle do not act on a knee joint, but they do stabilize the knee joint when we are standing still. Now talking about tensile facial lata, this is a muscle which is attached, uh, taking origin from the um, anterior part of iliac crest, outer lip, and it is inserted on iliotibial tract, which is in uh, turn inserted on the Gerdes tubercle. One of its function is to assist gluteus maximus muscle in tightening the fascia lata, supporting the la uh, thigh laterally. It also helps gluteus medius and minimus in abducting the thigh at hip joint and it is also a medial rotator of thigh just like gluteus medius and minimus. The main difference here is that this is a muscle of uh, gluteal region, but uh, as the fibers are pushed forward anteriorly, they cause flexion at a hip joint rather than extension. So this is the only muscle of posterior compartment or gl gluteal compartment which is going to cause flexion. The next two muscles of the superficial layer, although under cover of gluteus maximus, are gluteus medius and minimus. Gluteus uh, medius arises from the gluteal surface of ilium between anterior and posterior gluteal lines, while gluteus minimus arises between anterior and inferior gluteal lines. Gluteus medius is attached on the anterolateral aspect of greater trochanter, while gluteus minimus which is the deepest but it is the anterior most muscle is attached on the anterior surface of greater trochanter. Now these two muscles are going from the posterior surface towards the anterior surface of greater trochanter. 
so the direction of fibers indicate that first of all they are the abductors and secondly they are not external rotators or lateral rotators they are the medial rotators of um, femur at uh, hip joint the action of these muscle is not very simple if we uh, fix the lower limb then they cause pulling of um, hip girdle towards their side and in this way they are going to raise the hip bone of the opposite side this is important when the lower limb of uh, one side is fixed the gluteae of that side stabilize the pelvis of the opposite side because the other limb uh, is raised this will be demonstrated in the coming slides as Trendelenburg sign so we'll discuss it later also identify the rest of the muscles uh, piriformis which is arising from the pelvic surface of sacrum it comes out of uh, the pelvic cavity passing through the greater sciatic foramen and then it is inserted on the apex of greater rocanter obturator internus is also uh, arising from the uh, pelvic surface of obturator membrane and the adjacent rami and it comes out in the gluteal region by passing through the lesser sciatic notch here you can observe that it is making a right angle uh, passing through the greater sh uh, lesser sciatic notch and then is inserted along with the two gamelae on side or medial aspect of a greater trochanter the gamelae are arising from the upper and lower part of a greater sciatic notch the superior gamelus is arising just on from the posterior surface of ischial spine inferior gamelus is arising from part of ischial tuberosity they have a common insertion obturator internus muscle all these performance obturator internus and uh, the gamela they cause lateral rotation of thigh and abduction at thigh the last um, deep muscle is quadratus femoris and it is also a lateral rotator of thigh at hip joint and it is also a quadrangular or band like muscle which is going to keep femur fixed at the hip joint it originates from the lateral border of ischial tuberosity and femoral surface and it is inserted on the quadrate tubercle of intertrochanteric crest and the area inferior to it now also uh, talking about obturator externus which klm has included in the medial compartment and not in the gluteal region although it is a lateral rotator of thigh and it is also a small muscle which is going to help stabilize hip joint so please do not include obturator externus in gluteal muscles and these are the important bursa of gluteal region and these are mainly related to gluteus maximus muscle um, you can see gluteofemoral bursa where gluteus maximus is in just uh, inserted over the iliotibial tract just before that uh, point is this bursa located between the iliotibial tract and gluteus maximus and below the iliotibial tract is a past of, part of uh, vastus lateralis here so it is going to prevent the friction between vastus lateralis and uh, the attachment of gluteus maximus then you can see the trochanteric bursa lying over the lateral surface of greater trochanter and this is the part of greater trochanter which is not going to give attachment to any muscle and gluteus maximus muscle is lying just over it or passing just over it you can um, imagine by the cut fibers so um, it prevents friction between the bony surface of greater trochanter and gluteus maximus the third important um, bursa is ischial bursa which is located on that part of ischial tuberosity which is not going to give insertion or origin to any muscle and uh, when we are in standing position this part of ischial tuberosity is covered 
by gluteus maximus and so this bursa is between gluteus maximus and ischial tuberosity but when when we are in sitting position gluteus maximus uh, shifts up and this bursa is between the um, hard surface on which we are sitting and um, ischial tuberosity a small bursa you can observe is the bursa of obturator internus and this bursa is present over that part of um, um, hip bone where obturator internus is coming out of the greater sciatic foramen and making a 90 degree angle before it combines with the gamelae to insert over the greater trochanter so here there is friction when the muscle is going to contract so there is a bursa deep to obturator internus between the bone and the muscle now this is a condition called trochanteric bursitis you know the tro trochanteric bursa is lying on the lateral surface of greater trochanter deep to gluteus maximus muscle so if a person is continuously using gluteus maximus that is um, climbing stairs uh, uh, carrying a heavy weight or is running on an inclined plane or walking on an inclined plane for a long time or for a long duration then there can be inflammation of trochanteric bursa and the pain is on the lateral side uh, of the hip that is in the hip region and the area is painful or tender when we touch it Ischial bursitis can also occur when we are using the gluteus maximus muscle during sitting position for example during bicycling the thigh is flexed but gluteus maximus is also in use uh, due to repetitive um, extensions of thigh now uh, the point where we sit on is tender and um, there is also a pain increased pain when we are using gluteus maximus muscle so when we are uh, climbing the stairs or cycling and uh, there is this bursitis then we feel pain every time we take a step it is sometimes called waddling gait in total but in klm it is waddling gait in either cases when we make the patient walk to check the glutei muscles uh, and there is waddling gait on one side we say that the Trendelenburg test is positive if there is tilting on the left side then the muscles of right side are paralyzed The Trendelenburg sign results from unilateral, disrupted function of the primary abductor muscles of the hip, gluteus minimus and gluteus medius. Both muscles are innervated by the superior gluteal nerve, and their function can be compromised by damage to the nerve resulting from hip dislocation, hip surgery, or disease such as poliomyelitis, direct damage to the muscle bellies, or avulsion of their distal attachment from the femur can lead to weakness or loss of hip abduction. The Trendelenburg sign is most apparent during the walking gait cycle. When the weight of the body is supported by the leg on the lesion side, the pelvis rises ipsilaterally. In fact, this can more accurately be described as a dipping of the pelvis toward the contralateral side. Because the pelvis cannot be maintained in a level plane by the lesioned abductors, the patient falls toward the good side and simultaneously leans the torso toward the lesion side in an attempt to maintain balance. The mechanics behind the Trendelenburg sign are difficult, but can be made easier by first reviewing basic principles of joint movements. Joint movements can be described in different ways depending upon which skeletal elements are fixed or immobile. For instance, performing a dumbbell curl is an example of elbow flexion. More specifically, this motion can be described as flexion of the forearm at the elbow joint. The bones of the forearm are in motion, while the humerus is relatively immobile.
held in place by the muscles of the shoulder and chest. Likewise, performing a chin-up is also an example of elbow flexion. Now, however, we can describe the movement as flexion of the humerus at the elbow joint. The humerus is in motion while the bones of the forearm are immobilized by the fixation of the hands to the bar. By applying this principle to the movement of hip abduction, we can better appreciate how the Trendelenburg sign comes about. Hip abduction is the responsibility of gluteus medius and gluteus minimus, both of which are attached proximally to the pelvis and distally to the femur. Typically, hip abduction is visualized as raising the lower limb away from the body in a lateral direction, thereby making the angle between the thigh and torso more acute. During this type of hip movement, described as abduction of the femur at the hip joint, the pelvis remains fixed while the femur is pulled laterally by the contraction of gluteus medius and minimus on that side. However, we know that we can also achieve hip abduction in the opposite direction, that is, by tilting the pelvis laterally. This motion also decreases the angle between the thigh and the torso and can be described as abduction of the pelvis at the hip joint. Both of these examples of hip abduction depend on proper function of the gluteus medius and minimus muscles. In fact, raising the leg laterally while standing requires the simultaneous action of the abductors on both sides of the body. Obviously, the abductors on the right are contracting in order to raise the right lower extremity. But at the same time, the abductors on the left side, the supporting side, are contracting in order to immobilize the pelvis and maintain it in a neutral plane. They are, in fact, pulling the pelvis laterally in order to offset the weight of the unsupported right leg. This action, abduction of the hip on the side that is supported by contact with the ground, is key to understanding the Trendelenburg gait. Let's examine the normal walking gait. When the person's weight is supported by the left leg, the right leg is unsupported as it swings forward. The weight of the unsupported right leg should tilt the pelvis down towards the right side. However, the abductors on the left side offset this action by pulling the pelvis towards the fixed and stable left leg, thereby maintaining the pelvis in a neutral or non-tilted plane. Now let's look at the walking gait of someone with paralyzed hip abductors on the left side. When this person's weight is supported by the left leg and the right leg is unsupported as it swings forward, the paralyzed hip abductors on the left side are unable to offset the weight of the right leg. This causes the pelvis to tilt downward, throwing the body's center of gravity off. In order to counteract this imbalance, these persons will often maintain their center of gravity by leaning their torso back to the left each time the right leg is unsupported. Remember that the dysfunctional abductor muscles are on the same side as the supporting leg. The simplest way to assess the integrity of the hip abductors in the clinic is to ask your patient to stand motionless on one leg. If the hip abductors connected to the supporting leg are intact, the pelvis will remain level and the torso will not lean toward the supported side of the body. If, on the other hand, the abductors of the supporting leg are injured, the patient will exhibit the Trendelenburg sign. The pelvis will tilt away from the supported side and the patients will either lose their balance or try to maintain their center of gravity with a compensatory leaning of the torso toward the side of injury. Intramuscular injections are given in gluteus maximus muscle and here you can see in the green area uh, that the injection is uh, given in the upper outer quadrant of the gluteus maximus muscle. You can see that uh, upper inner quadrant, lower inner quadrant and lower outer quadrants, they are not safe. As in the lower region, you can see uh, sciatic nerve is passing deep to gluteus maximus muscle on the inner quadrants and uh, in the outer lower quadrant and upper inner quadrant superior and inferior gluteal nerves and vessels are located so they are not safe for uh, safe zones for the intramuscular injection 
Now you can see that uh, the index finger is uh, on the anterior superior alex spine and then we spread the finger till the middle finger locates the tubercle of ilex crest and the injection is given in between these fingers. This not only prevents uh, nerve injury but uh, also if the vessels are damaged by intramuscular injection there can be a hematoma deep to the gluteus maximus muscle and uh, we should be very careful in intramuscular injections. This diagram shows the different gateways from which structures are passing from the abdominal and pelvic cavity towards the different compartments of thigh. As we know, the major vessels are lying along the abdominal wall and also along the um, pelvic walls. And the nerves which are going to supply lower limb are also arising as a lumbosacral plexus within the pelvic cavity. So these structures have to enter the different compartments of thigh and gluteal region by passing through gateways. For example, from the anterior abdominal wall um, or should I say below the anterior abdominal wall, structures are passing below the inguinal ligament to enter the anterior compartment of thigh. Here we can see gap between the inguinal ligament and pelvic bone. We have sos major and iliacus muscle, pectineus muscles which are arising uh, from the part of bone within the pelvis. And then femoral artery which is continuation of external iliac artery, femoral vein, lymphatics, femoral branch of genitofemoral nerve, lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh and femoral nerve. The second gateway that we identify is towards the medial compartment of thigh and it is known as obturator canal. It is formed by the obturator notch on the inferior aspect of uh, the superior ramus of pubis and obturator membrane. Through this obturator nerve and obturator vessels are going to pass uh, from the pelvic cavity towards the medial compartment of thigh. The next and important gateway for, from, for the gluteal region is the greater sciatic foramen. You can uh, see here that the piriformis muscle is passing through the greater sciatic foramen, all, almost filling up this foramen and also uh, dividing this foramen into two parts, a superior part and inferior part. Now, structures passing above the piriformis muscle are superior gluteal nerve, artery and vein while structures passing below piriformis muscle are sciatic nerve, inferior gluteal nerve artery and vein, pudendal nerve, internal pudendal artery and vein, posterior femoral cutaneous nerve, nerve to obturator internus and nerve to quadratus femoris. Now we'll learn in the perineum and pelvis when we study that in second year MBBS that internal pudendal vessels and the pudendal nerve has to pass out of pelvis uh, by passing through the greater sciatic foramen and then after entering the gluteal region they bend over the ischial spine and enter the lesser sciatic foramen to enter pel perineum. So basically this structure or relation is important uh, but not here in perineum. So observing here, the lesser hiatic foramen contains obturator internus a muscle tendon which is uh, emerging out of uh, the cavity and the pudendal nerve and internal pudendal vessels passing into the perineum. Again showing uh, two different views uh, through which Sacrotuberous ligament here in the posterior aspect you can see arising from the posterior outer part of sacrum and attached to the uh, ischial tuberosity and then um, on the posterior view not quite visible so on from the superior view we can see sacrospinous ligament uh, coming from the anterior aspect of sacrotuberous ligament from the lateral side of sacrum and is attached to the ischial spine and on this superior view you can easily identify the two foramen which are formed the greater sciatic foramen and the lesser sciatic foramen the detail of these foramen are given in bd
and i've also listed the structures in the previous presentation and then in the video coming ahead The sacrotuberous and sacrospinous ligaments convert the greater sciatic notch and lesser sciatic notch into greater sciatic foramen and lesser sciatic foramen, respectively. The greater sciatic foramen is considered as the door of the gluteal region, through which all arteries and nerves enter into the gluteal region from the pelvis. The structures passing through the greater sciatic foramen are as follows. The piriformis muscle. It emerges from the pelvis and almost completely fills the foramen. It is the key muscle of this region. Because of the presence of the piriformis, the greater sciatic foramen is divided into two openings. The suprapiriform foramen, located above the piriformis, and the infrapiriform foramen located below the piriformis. By way of the suprapiriform foramen are leaving the pelvis, the superior gluteal nerve and the superior gluteal artery. By way of the infrapiriform foramen are passing much more structures and those are the inferior gluteal artery and the inferior gluteal nerve the sciatic nerve, which is the most lateral structure, the posterior cutaneous nerve of thigh, nerve to quadratus femoris, nerve to obturator internus, pudendal artery, and pudendal nerve. The last three structures cross the dorsal aspect of ischial spine and adjoining part of sacrospinous ligament and curves forward to enter the perineum by way of lesser sciatic foramen. Another structure which passes through the lesser sciatic foramen, besides nerve to obturatory internus, pudendal nerve and pudendal artery, is the tendon of obturator internus, which leaves the pelvis by way of lesser sciatic foramen to be inserted on the greater procanter. All right, here we are in the lower extremity once again, and we're going to be describing now the gluteal region uh, in terms of muscle compartments. So this is the gluteal regions. We're going to talk about actually nine muscles. Now, don't be intimidated. I know nine muscles may sound a little bit uh, intense, but it's not. Uh, once you kind of get this down, you'll be fine. So let's first take a look at the first and most famous one. This is called the gluteus maximus muscle. Incredibly powerful hip extensor. So you'll find that the gluteus maximus muscle just kind of comes across here. Uh, but in the same sense, we get a second muscle with the same with the same first name. This is called the gluteus medius. Now notice you can still see medius even when I uh, even without taking off maximus. So if I take off maximus, you'll be able to see a much larger uh, mount of the medius. Now this is not necessarily a hip extensor as much as a hip abductor. Uh, that's why when you roller blade you actually use these guys better, but you could actually feel them on the sides of your body rather than grabbing onto your buns here. So that's gluteus maximus and then here's gluteus medius and there is a muscle that cannot be shown or is not shown here. Uh, if I were to strip away gluteus medius, you'll find a much smaller version of it directly underneath it called the gluteus minimus. So three gluteus muscles, maximus, medius, and minimus. And then the rest of them become these lateral rotators of the hip. You'll find, uh, here's the pure, this is what we call the piriformis muscle, a good abductor of the, of the hip, or at least initiates abduction. And then here is the sciatic nerve. So I always remember piriformis typically, unless it's a pathological condition, sciatic nerves typically comes out underneath the piriformis. But the other ones become the superior gemellus, obturator internus, 
inferior gemellus, and then quadratus femoris. Notice again, we use that term quadratus for four-sided, and then we use the, the term femoris because it's found in the femur region rather than in the lumborum or in the wherever you're going to find other quadratus like pronator quadratus or other things like that.